So I would like you to go on a small journey with me real quick before I get into the geeky part of the talk. I would like for you to think about the conception of an infinite entity. An infinite entity, one that is always existing. And so when we think about that, we think of something that is very godlike. However, I would argue that 360,000 of them are born every day in the globe, in the world. Another, or of that, there's 10,000 that are born just in the United States. And we get so excited every time they're born, as we get excited when everybody's born, right? Like, we get so excited. We're like, yay, this is going to be an infinite being. Like, we're excited, we're good. What I do know for sure, however, is that you probably aren't. What happens is you get this amazing birth certificate that has the number VA261759 emblazoned on it, and all you see are cute little baby feet. But for me, that's the beginning of an entire being. What you will begrudgingly do is figure out how to put their height and weight in and tell me where they live. And, and you'll even try to figure out how in the world you're going to get gold inflected hazel to fit into a checkbox that says brown. <laughs> <laughs> but it's important. We need to know how many brown eyed people are born every day. And that's kind of where you leave it. You don't think about it again. Me, on the other hand, I get to watch all of the characteristics. I get to see blood type. I get to see heights and weights. I get to understand how they're living on a day-to-day -day basis. If there's any anomalies, if there's a sixth finger, I get all of that information. More importantly, what I get to do is I get to watch this, this in, infinite being grow. I get to watch the other names they're called by. Sometimes it's social security number, sometimes it's state issued ID, occasionally it's the child welfare case number, and more often than I would like, it's the criminal record number. But all of that is VA261759. All of it, VA261759. That is the number that lets me know that you are still going. Now, over the years, I get to actually watch all of the characteristics kind of refine themselves. I get to see GPAs, the, infinite, the infamous student permanent record. I get to see that, like it's awesome. <laughs> we get what college you're gonna go to. We get to understand how many calories you ate that day. We get to understand if you liked the calories that you ate, and more than that, if you honestly took a picture of it and it looked good, I might go get it, right? <laughs> the risk to this is that you don't know that you exist like that. The risk to this is that you think you're just real life. You don't understand we don't understand that we actually exist in the data universe as a complete embodiment of life with all of the attributes of the living. What's more scary is that our life is terminated with the death record. For me, that just simply means that we get a snapshot of you in a moment in time, but you're always relevant. What happened in 1973? It was the end of Vietnam. But I know every person that perished that year. I also know every person that was born that year. So it's an infinite being with infinite implications for our future. So now the geeky part of the talk. I've spent 20 years watching people live, breathe, grow in data. I am that person that watches all of that stuff. But this discussion is not about 
surveillance. It is not about Big Brother. It is not about the dangerous hacker. It can't be about that because a certain percentage of you actually think that's a good idea. And you justify it calling it national security. This is actually a different conversation. It's a conversation about the fact that there are decisions that are being made based on your data votes, for lack of a better word, that you're not yet engaged in the conversation. My favorite example is actually a recent one. It's pretty funny to me. Jeff Bezos, in his Amazonian enterprise, not empire, but enterprise, <laughs> just purchased Whole Food. That sounds awesome, especially for those of us that had stock in them. We're like, yes. <laughs> this is awesome. And the newspapers are justifying it, saying, hey, this is the best distribution network ever for organic food. Right? So we're on it. We're like, yeah. But I'm going to give you some other justifications for it. And I want you to really listen to what I'm saying, because this is how we vote in data. This is how each one of us vote in the realm of data. The organic food market is $39.7 billion. That is the number one way we vote. But let's just go with that for a second. $39.7 billion. In that, the most influential set of votes come from the millennials to the tune of 52%. 52% of millennials buy and believe in organic food. OK, awesome, right? So what will happen is they have bought Whole Foods, the number one distribution network in the world for organic materials, to serve the 52% of millennials who get this have not even started creating their infinite entities yet. So this is an ongoing, this is an exponential like purchase. What they're failing to consider, what we are failing to consider every single time we walk into Whole Foods and spend $12 on a kale salad, And aside there, we spend more money on food today than any generation before us. But I digress. All right, $12 for the kale salad. You with me? We did that due to convenience. Honestly, that same 52% of influence over that $39.7 billion opportunity tends to vote local, sustainable, and urban farmer or local farmer-centric. Now, as a single mom of three boys, I'm going to be honest. If Jeff wants to drone drop a box of fresh veggies on my door, I'm good with that. Like, I might even bow down in gratitude. <laughs> <laughs> but I understand that I am doing that at the expense of my own real life morals, values, and ethics that I believe in today, localization is probably where we need to start our global adventure together. And in understanding that, I really can't justify the $12 kale salad, much less the $50 drone drop box of veggies, because there's a farmer in Western Virginia that I did not vote with. Now, how do we change that? What does that mean for us? It means a couple things. It means that we acknowledge that we cannot get off the grid. Because you leave your cell phone at home, because you do not wear the latest amazing wearable technology does not mean that you are not gridded. We think that we disappear because we don't carry a device. That is not true. If you have a bill for service, I got you. <laughs> I got you. If you walk into a grocery store, I got you. That's kind of how Big Brother works. If you were speeding, yep, got you. <laughs> Did you skip the toll? I got you. <laughs> Are you with me? The problem is, because you don't know that I got you, you didn't know that you just voted that way. You didn't know 
that we glean the infrastructure for tomorrow based on how you vote unintentionally today. And what I am, as a 20-year offender of collecting your data, I am entreating you, I am imploring myself to do the following. To one, to understand that there are right now no comprehensive laws covering your data today. Beyond HIPAA, there aren't any. However, there are hundreds of cases going before the case today to discuss the collection of, the sharing of, the aggregation of, the storing of, the archiving of your information. You need to be in that conversation. You need to let us know that you know that we're doing that and that you want to be part of the solution. So if Jeff is going to buy Whole Foods and we're going to buy $12 salads, then perhaps because we recognize why he's buying Whole Foods, we get into the conversation and say, we will only participate if Whole Foods incorporates the local farmer. <laughs> so I would leave you with three responsibilities that we have. Responsibility number one. You have the responsibility to understand your data. If you are scrolling through 23 pages of, I don't even know what this means, and you click the I agree box, that's wrong. <laughs> that's how you lose your DNA, for those of us who did that. Two, we do have the responsibility to, to understand our data. When we fill out a form, when we share it, we need to know where it goes and what the implications are. When you take a picture, who else unintentionally gets affected by that? And lastly, we need to understand that we do have the responsibility to share our data, to collect our data together, to create those federations that will help create the future that our real lives have indicated that perhaps our virtual lives do not agree with. Because at the end of the day, we are citizen data. We are the ones who create tomorrow. We've just been doing it unintentionally. Thank you.